We are coming to the end of our Apostles' Creed series, and I want to thank everybody who participated in that little video. Uh, for those of you who are watching online this morning, check our Facebook page this afternoon and the YouTube channel. We'll put that video up, but it's, it was fun to gather together different faces from Highview to say the Apostles' Creed together as something that we believe, but it's not something that just this church believes, but we've talked about how we are united together with Christians throughout the ages who believe and confess these same things. And so it is something that ties us together as the Church of Jesus Christ. So today we are coming to the last message in this series. Um, and before we jump into the scripture reading this morning, I just want to say a quick word about where we're going next week. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to start a new series, and it's going to be a series of four messages that will go through Christmas Eve. And we're going to be looking at the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9, where it talks about the child who would be born, this reference to the coming of the Messiah, the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, for to us, a child is, uh, is born, and to us, a son is given, it says. And then it gives these titles for Christ, and it calls him Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And so over the next four messages, starting next Sunday, we're going to look at those four titles, and we're going to explore in depth what those mean and how they give us a deeper picture of who Jesus is and what he means for our lives. So I hope you'll join us for that, whether in person or live stream. Next Sunday we'll start that. But today we're going to conclude this series on the Apostles' Creed. And... I'm going to be reading several passages of Scripture to start us off here this morning. So if you have your Bible and you'd like to follow along, you can open with me first to Genesis chapter 2, and I will be starting in verse 4. Hear now the word of the Lord. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold that of that land is good. Bdellium and onyx, stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gishon, the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Skipping to chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Skipping down to verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden 
to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now reading from chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this series where we have been able to examine and consider those beliefs which are most foundational and fundamental to our faith. Lord, we pray that as we conclude this series today, you would show us more clearly what it means that you are a God of redemption and what it means that we are part of your story of redemption. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we come to the last three phrases of the Apostles' Creed, which state that I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Now I have to admit to you that as I was preparing for this message, I really struggled to figure out how I was going to do a sermon covering all three of those phrases. And I wondered even if I made a huge mistake in choosing to cover all three of those phrases as my last message of this series. Because each one of those phrases is a huge biblical topic that deserves attention of its own and could have a sermon of its own preached on it. So I wondered, maybe I made a mistake here. But then I came to a realization, and that is that these last three phrases sort of go together. They're connected to one another, and there's a reason, I think, that they form the conclusion of the Apostles' Creed. The statements, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting, all three of those are very radical statements when you think about it. Because if you go back to the earliest pages of Scripture, you do not find the forgiveness of sins resurrection of the body and life everlasting. That's not what you find. In fact, you find the quite opposite of that. You go back to the early pages of Scripture, and instead of finding forgiveness, resurrection, and eternal life, you find sin, death, and judgment in Genesis chapter 3. And so I found myself wondering, how is it that Christians say, I believe in resurrection, forgiveness, and eternal life, when the beginning of the Bible starts, you might say, with the opposite of those things. How do we get from point A to point B? And then it hit me, that's really the grand story of the Bible. Listen to this. The Bible is the grand story of how God brings humanity out of sin, death, and judgment and into forgiveness, resurrection, and eternal life. I want to say that again because that's my central core argument this morning. The Bible is the grand story of how God brings humanity out of sin, death, and judgment into forgiveness, resurrection, and eternal life. And these last three phrases of the Apostles' Creed encapsulate all of that. They offer us sort of three vantage points from which we can view this grand story of the Bible. And so this morning, instead of looking at one biblical text together... We're going to take a journey through the entire Bible from cover to cover. 
we are going to look at the whole story of the Bible, and we're going to see that this whole story unfolds in five different stages, and these three vantage points offer us unique vantage points from which to view this unfolding plan of redemption. So are you ready for this journey through the Bible? We're only going to be here for five or six hours, so I hope you ate a very big breakfast this morning. No, I promise you. In the next few minutes, we're going to go through the entire story of the Bible, and you're going to see how this unfolds. So here's stage number one, creation. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so the Bible begins not only with the creation of the heavens and the earth, but it begins with the creation of humanity. In Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so what can we say about the three vantage points that this conclusion to the creed offers us? We can say three things. Number one, at creation, there is the absence of sin. Genesis 1.31 says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That is one way of describing the fact that there was no sin in creation. And furthermore... Adam and Eve, before the fall, were in a unique position where they had the ability to either sin or not to sin. And so there was this absence of sin. And secondly, at creation, there was the absence of death. Sometimes you'll hear people today say things like, well, you know, death is just a natural part of this world. Well, nothing could be further from the truth if you look at scripture. Death is not a natural part of the world. It's a very foreign thing to creation. When God created everything, there was no death originally. Death is a consequence of the fall. And so death is a very unnatural part of creation. There's the absence of sin. There's the absence of death. And thirdly, there's the possibility of eternal life at creation. In Genesis 2.16, God says to Adam and Eve... You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now that verse tells us a couple of things. First of all, it tells us what would happen to Adam and Eve if they disobeyed. Death would become a reality. But it also tells us something else that I find very interesting, and that is that Adam and Eve were given the ability and the opportunity to eat of all the trees that were in the Garden of Eden, except for this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that means that they had access to every tree in the garden, including the tree of life. What that tells us is that at this point, they had the possibility of eternal life. If they were to obey God, they could have entered into eternal life. Theologians call this, uh, this stage that Adam and Eve were in before the fall as sort of a period of probation. They weren't yet fallen, but neither were they yet confirmed in a state of eternal righteousness. They had the ability to choose whether to obey God or disobey God. And in that sense, they had the possibility of eternal life. Not a reality, but a possibility. And this is what we see at creation. Now that brings us to stage number two. Stage number two of this story is the fall. Of course, in Genesis 3, we see that Satan enters the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent and tents, tempts Adam and Eve to question God's word and to disobey God. And this moment marks a radical turning point through the journey of Scripture. If you look at these three vantage points again, you see how everything begins to change. First of all, the fall. Now there is the presence of sin. Before there was an absence of sin, and now there is the presence of sin in creation. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and sin enters creation. And now from this point forward, the entire history of humanity is marked by the presence of sin. I mean, think about it with me. Adam and Eve have children. Their children have more descendants. And with every generation, what do we see? We see the multiplication of sin. So that by the time you get to Noah... Here's how it says, here's how it describes the state of things. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So God sends a flood to wipe out all of humanity except for this one family and starts over. But after the flood, we see that not much has changed. 
because God brings his people out of Egypt and his people are still sinning and grumbling against him and complaining against him. And then God brings his people into the promised land and they still are not obeying his law. And so God sends judges to lead the people. But uh, during this period of the judges, people are still not listening to God and following his law. In fact, do you remember what it says about the period of the judges? It, it sort of summarizes that era by saying, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So the judges did not provide a solution, so God sends kings to the people to rule over them. And yet people were still disobedient to God, and in fact, even the kings were corrupt, 99% of them. So then God sends his people prophets, and he calls them back to him and calls them to repentance through his prophets, and yet the people don't listen to the prophets. And so you see the entire history, history of humanity is marked by the presence of sin. But not only that, at the fall we see the presence of death. God told Adam and Eve that if they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would die. The penalty for sin is death. And so, although death was not present before the fall, death is present and it's an inescapable reality after the fall. So Paul says in Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Not only do we see the presence of sin and the presence of death, but we also see the reality of judgment. Sin causes us to be separated from God, to be separated from our creator and under his own just judgment. And you can see this reality reflected very clearly in Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3.24 says, God drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. I don't know about you, but that image has always just sort of captivated my mind. I remember reading that when I was younger and thinking, what on earth is going on here with a flaming sword and all of this strange stuff? What's going on here, though, is that Humanity is being cut off from God's presence. So that now, instead of being with God in the garden, they are banished from the garden. Instead of having access to the tree of life, they are cut off from the tree of life. And they're separated from God. And now you have the reality of judgment which hangs over the head of all of humanity. And this means that without any intervention we would be separated from God and separated from the tree of life from all eternity. So that brings us to stage number three, which is redemption. Thankfully, of course, we know that God did not abandon us in our sin, but he sent a rescuer to save us from death and to save us from judgment. And this rescuer was his very own son who would rescue us by going to the cross. And so what does that mean for these same three vantage points? Number one, when it comes to sin, Christ's work marks an atonement for sin. And we talked about this in our previous messages, particularly when we talked about what it means that Christ was crucified, but that he was a substitutionary atonement. So that when Christ went to the cross, he was not dying for his own sins because he had no sins. He was standing in our place and dying for our sins as a substitution on our behalf. You see this reflected all over in the scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Hebrews 9, 26 says, He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You see, as Jesus dies on the cross, he makes an atonement for sin. But secondly, Christ's work marks the defeat of death. Christ did not just die on the cross, but he rose again three days later, so that Peter says in Acts 2.24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Ever since the fall, as I said, death has been an inescapable reality. And you know, death is like the great equalizer. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter... Uh, how smart you are, it doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't matter how poor you are. Death is an inescapable reality. And no matter how powerful man has become throughout all of history, 
That's one reality that has never been able to be taken away. No one has been able to conquer death. Those who say they're going to conquer death are just fools. But there was one man who conquered death, and that was Jesus. 2 Timothy 1.10 says, Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So that now, at the stage of redemption, Christ doesn't just atone for sin, but he defeats death. And then thirdly, he satisfies God's judgment. As I said earlier, we don't need to just be saved from sin and death. We need to be saved from God's judgment. And when Christ dies on the cross, he doesn't just take our sins on his shoulders. He takes the judgment for those sins on his shoulders. So that he satisfies God's judgment. This is the stage of redemption. Now that brings us to a fourth stage, which is what we might call new humanity. The benefits that Jesus achieved on the cross are not automatically applied to anyone. I'm going to make that very clear. The benefits that Jesus achieved and accomplished on the cross are not automatically applied to anyone. The Bible says those benefits must be appropriated. They must be received somehow. And how are those benefits received? Well, the Bible makes very clear that it's by grace alone, through faith alone. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. In other words, the only way to receive the benefits that have been achieved by Christ is by God's grace as a gift through faith in Jesus Christ. When that happens, the Bible says that a person becomes a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that's why we call this stage new humanity. There is a new humanity that is instituted for those who have trusted in Jesus Christ right here and right now. So what does that mean for these three perspectives? Well, number one, that means there's forgiveness of sin for those who trust in Christ. Acts 10.43 says, To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We receive forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ immediately right here, right now. That's not a future reality. That's a present reality for those who know Christ. But it's not the only reality. Because we aren't just forgiven of our sins. We are also credited with the righteousness of Christ. When you trust in Christ, he not only takes all of your sin, but you receive all of his righteousness so that when you stand before God, you are accepted by God on the basis of his perfect record. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So in the new humanity, right here, right now, for those who trust in Christ, there is forgiveness of sins. But there is also promises for the future. There's the promise of resurrection. So that those who trust in Christ don't just have sin forgiven now, but have the promise of resurrection later, just as Christ defeated death and rose again. So those who are in Christ will rise again. Paul says in Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And that's not all. Because there's also the promise of eternal life. Instead of eternal judgment and separation from God, there's the promise of eternal life and union with God. So Paul says in Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or as Jesus himself says in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. And so then this brings us to the last stage of the story. Stage 5 is a new creation. And this, this is the stage of the story which is still yet to come. And the Bible says that just as God created the heavens and the earth at the beginning, at the end of the Bible, he creates a new heavens and a new earth. And on that day, we're told that everything will be made new, 
And on that day, everything will be perfect as it once was before the fall. And what can we say about these three vantage points? Well, first, in the new creation, sin will be eradicated. See, right now, we can experience the forgiveness of sins, but sin is not eradicated yet. Another way of putting it is that right now, if you are a Christian, the power of sin has been canceled, but the presence of sin still remains in the world and in our lives, and we battle against it. But one day, sin will be eradicated. In the new heavens and the new earth, it's not just that sin won't be present. Sin won't be possible because God's people will be fully redeemed and glorified. Revelation 22, verse 3 says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. So the sin will be eradicated. Number two, our bodies will be resurrected. In the new humanity, resurrection is a future promise, but then it will be a reality. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. On that day, death will be no more. Death is an inescapable reality now. But Jesus conquered death, and one day death will be mo- no more. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And then third and finally, in the new creation, there will be eternal life. The Bible begins with the possibility of eternal life. The fall happens and there's the reality of judgment. The Bible ends with eternal life in the new creation because of what Jesus has done. And I don't know if you've ever spent much time closely reading Revelation 22. I'd highly recommend you do. It is so fascinating to me that in Revelation 22, the new creation is described as like a restored Eden. It's a garden. And in fact, if you look closely, there's a tree of life. And the clear message there is that the paradise that was once lost will be restored and that even though we were cut off from the presence of God, we will one day again be united in the presence of God forever, those who believe in Christ. And even though there was then no access to the tree of life, we will once again have access to the tree of life. There will be eternal life for all of those who trust in Jesus Christ. And this is the new creation. We just read the whole Bible in like, how many minutes was that? Did anybody set a timer? (laughs) This is the whole unfolding story of redemption in the Bible. I said earlier, the Bible is the grand story of how God brings humanity out of sin and death and judgment into forgiveness, resurrection, and eternal life. And I want to conclude by asking you this morning, where do you find yourself in this story? Today's the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a time when we remember the coming of, of Jesus Christ, the birth of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Son of God into the world. You know, there's a reason why Advent receives our attention every single year, why we have a special season dedicated to this, because we realize and recognize that the birth of Christ is a pivotal moment in this grand story of redemption. And so Advent should serve as a reminder to us that we are living in the midst of a grand story of redemption that still is not finished yet and so I want to ask you where do you find yourself in this story what I mean by that is some people might find themselves still living in the stage of the story that we know as the fall in other words there are many people maybe someone watching or listening to this today who would not consider themselves a believer they're not interested in God or or the things of God and would say well I I make my own way and I live my own life, and I live my own story. And, and what I would encourage you to see, if that is you, is that 
No matter how much you want to make your own story, you are inescapably living in the reality of a larger story. And you, just like me and everyone else who is gathered here today, has a problem. And that problem is called sin. And if that problem is not dealt with, then we have an inescapable reality of death and judgment, which we cannot solve on our own. So what are you going to do about that? How are you going to respond to that? Others might be listening to this message this morning and you find yourself a little somewhere else in the journey. Maybe you're listening to this and you are looking at this unfolding story and realizing the reality of redemption for the very first time and recognizing that there is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. He's the only rescuer. He's the only redeemer. He's the only one who can provide forgiveness of sins. He's the only one who has conquered death. He is the only one who can provide eternal life. If that's you and you're listening to this and you are recognizing that right now, then here's my plea. Don't delay any longer because you can embrace Jesus Christ as he is freely offered in the gospel right now and all of the benefits which Jesus achieved on the cross can be yours and are promised to those who come to him and trust in him in faith and repentance. Now, I would imagine many of you who are sitting here this morning or listening or watching online would probably place yourself in this story in the stage of what we call new humanity. In other words, you have already trusted in Christ, been redeemed by Christ, had your sins forgiven by Christ, and you're living in this stage of the story where you are waiting for the final promises of the new creation. If you're in that place this morning, here's my challenge for you as we begin this series of Advent. Remember who you are. Don't forget who you are because the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And that means if you are a Christian, you're called to live as a new creation right here and right now. If we are going to be people month after month and year after year who say the words of the Apostles' Creed and say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. If we're going to be people who say those words, then I think we better be prepared to be people who live like we believe those words. Because those words should transform who we are and how we live right here and right now. Who are we? Well, Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So my prayer for this church is that we would not be a people who just say the Apostles' Creed, and we would not just be a people even who say we believe the Apostles' Creed. That's good. But I pray for something more than that. That we would be a people not who just say it or believe it, but who actually live the Apostles' Creed. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we have reflected on these truths throughout the course of this series, Lord, we have been reminded of many, many of the most important realities which are laid out in your word. And yet I still recognize, Lord, that for all of us, it's easy to take these truths for granted. Forgive us for the ways in which we do take the truth of your word for granted. And Lord, help us to be a people who don't just believe in Christ, but also who live as the new creations that you have called us to be. We thank you for your grace, O oh Lord. We thank you for your promises, for the promise of forgiveness and resurrection and eternal life. And as we go through this season of Advent, Lord, help us to be a people who are eagerly awaiting for that day when you, Lord Jesus, will return. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.